Here's some work. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. Um, I just want to let you know um, I have started the recording for this event. Uh, we are going to be talking about caring for the caregiver. My name is Mary Roberge, and I am your host today. And I'm also a volunteer with AARP in New Hampshire. For those of you uh, who want to look at the recording again, it will be posted in a few days and it will be available on our YouTube site at HTPS, I mean, HTTPS, www.youtube.com slash at AARPNH1. I will put that link in the chat so it is available to you. I am glad that you've all uh, put yourself on mute, but if you do have a question, please feel free to put it in the chat and um, I will raise them to Kelly throughout the presentation. I do want to know, let you know that here at AARP New Hampshire, we are focused on the health and the financial security and social connections that are critical to the well-being of the 50 plus in the Granite State. We do carry our work out through targeted advocacy at the state and federal level, through compelling engagement of the 50 plus community statewide, and we serve as a trusted resource for information for our members and the public. I wanna welcome you to this virtual gathering, whether you're a new caregiver or you're an experienced caregiver. Many of us who are not uh, caregivers will probably be so uh, sometime in the future um, because of life's unexpected events. We want to be sure that you are aware of the many resources that are available for caregivers. IARP does have a website uh, at www.aarp.org slash caregiving, and I will also put that link in the chat. Um, and I just want to let you know that we do have helpful guides called Prepare to Care um, for every demographic, um, and it's in multiple languages, and um, we hope that um, you find it available to you. I want to introduce Kelly Dwyer. She is our uh, presenter tonight. She is the founder of Nature Education Opportunities, which is an award-winning environmental educator and a certified New Hampshire elementary teacher. She has been creating and delivering engaging programs for audiences of all ages for over 15 years. And I have to correct myself, she is an award-winning environmental educator and a certified New Hampshire elementary teacher. As a certified wellness coach, Kelly also brings a deep understanding of the numerous benefits of connecting with the natural world to reduce stress, improve health, and embrace a more mindful approach to life and learning. She is an avid gardener and cook, and she loves to spend time with her family, which includes her husband and her two daughters, and enjoying nature. Kelly, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you so much, Mary. And thank all of you who are, are out there and have um, dedicated this time for yourselves to really Take a moment back from, like Mary said, if you're currently a caregiver or you're anticipating this role coming your way at some point in the future, I think you're giving yourself a wonderful gift. And so I just want to go over our workshop agenda this evening because it will help frame our conversation. And please feel free to put questions in the chat. Um, I My favorite way to present is to be in person so that we can have sort of an ongoing dialogue. But this will be an opportunity, like Mary said, there's a recording so you can review it because one thing that I will be going over in this workshop are different strategies, breathing strategies, nature uh, connection strategies. So hopefully you can come away after our time together with a real sense if you have a plan to, to mitigate your stress. But in terms of our, our different sections tonight, we have defining caregiver roles, which is a, a kind of a unique perspective on what makes a caregiver. Um, as I was thinking about this presentation, I was surprised at the different roles that I came up with that I've played in my life or have had different friends play. And then we'll also go over what some of the impacts of caregiving are. And being in that role, it affects us not only physically, emotionally, even financially. So we'll, we'll chat about that. And then that will frame our conversation on how we can actually 
create these simple and effective self-care strategies for our well-being. And our final little segment will be those community resources. So you will have uh, the link as well as in the chat. I have it on a slide here for the AARP uh, webpage, which has just an absolute plethora of resources for you, different caregiving roles, as well as some ideas of where you can find support within your own community. Okay, so let's kind of take a step and like I said, frame the conversation. So um, many of us think of the caregiving role as that traditional children taking care of aging parents. And, and I will sort of disclose that's where I find myself right now with not only my aging parents, but my aging mother-in-law, just uh, special people in, in my life that have been there for me through different parts of, of being a parent. Um, and now I find that the, the role is changing a little bit. So I can certainly appreciate on a very deep level, if that's the role you find yourself in right now. Um, some of us may find that we are a partner or a spouse that's taking care of, of, um, of our loved one in maybe a temporary nursing role or maybe in more of a chronic, a permanent role. Um, parents who may have a child with a disability that you have seen yourself in that caregiving role since your child was born. So you also have a really deep understanding of what that can mean. Or if you have, if you are a sibling taking care of another sibling with, with a variety of challenges or needs, or if you have a loved one, a neighbor that's a, de a dear friend. So you can also be um, understanding that you are just as much a caregiver. So um, those are kind of some of the traditional roles that I have cobbled together as I looked at what uh, the typical caregiver looks like in terms of, of the demographic. Um, I thought, Mary, I want to just check in to see if we have any questions so far, or any points of clarification before we go forward. No, there are, there are no questions at this time, Kelly. Okay, great. All right. Um, and then so we can kind of frame this with the physical impacts. So obviously, if we're providing a certain level of care for a loved one, that person may be in our home or they may be nearby that we're having to travel to provide this type of support, it can increase our level of stress. And we'll talk about that in a moment, what stress is and how it actually can manifest in loss of sleep. Um, because we are worried about this uh, loved one or we are actually spending more time providing services and care so that it impacts our, um, you know, eight hours of sleep, if, if we're lucky to get that. It can also definitely impact um, our physical energy in terms of the additional needs that we may have to provide support, whether it's providing um, additional meals or transportation to and from doctor's appointments, and even maybe mowing the lawn of a loved one or taking care of their household management. So again, we have a limited amount of energy, time, and hours in a day, and this may uh, in, kind of cut into that. And one thing that I personally have found to be my experience, and many of you may as well, is disruptions to our well being routine, not only maybe our exercise and things that keep us healthy, as well as our diet. So we may be eating on the fly or not being able to do our um, exercises that keep us in a really good situation physically. So those are the physical impacts. And um, in terms of the emotional impacts, these may be things that may not be as apparent to some of those physical things like stress and lack of sleep. We may find ourselves feeling more of a sense of grief, seeing the decline of a loved one or feeling that sense of pending loss can really impact us on a deep physical, I mean, deep emotional level. We may also experience frustration and anger, just anger at that this is happening to a loved one. And it's happening to us too, in terms of taking maybe ourselves away from our own families. So frustration and anger are very real emotions. You may even feel that you're being feeling trapped or even overwhelmed by a situation. And again, this is why it's really imperative in that last slide to think about those community-based resources so you can get some help um, with managing these multiple needs of caregiving burned out. Absolutely. You may feel burned out in many areas of your life, not only with the caregiving responsibilities and roles, but with your own uh, careers, your own children, your own friends. So this is sort of a pervasive feeling of just overwhelm and burnout. And I think fear is at the basis of a lot of these feelings. It's fear of change, fear of loss, 
fear of the unknown. What is the future going to bring? It may even be a situation, what is next week going to bring? There might be a doctor's appointment or there may be a move of a loved one into more of a skilled care facility. So there's a lot of fear that may be sort of circulating around in our, in our emotional state. Um, financial impacts. It could be that maybe you're having to step back from um, full-time employment, taking a leave of absence to manage more of an acute caregiving role. It could be loss of income or having to make employment choices. Many of us, when we find ourselves in traditional caregiving roles, particularly aging parents or maybe even a spouse, we may be at the peak of our career and we may have to make choices that will impact potentially adversely where our career is continuing to go. So those can really put some financial burden on us. Even the household budget strain, if we're supporting um, another household, it can take the, the food shopping, you know, even something like fixing um, an aging furnace or something like to maintain another household. As we all know, that can be expensive. So if we're contributing to the maintenance of a household of a loved one that we're providing care for, that can put a strain on our budget. And it can also be something that um, if you're managing an agent, aging parent's budget, it can feel a little strange to but suddenly be having a role in that financial um, situation of a parent um, or even another loved one. Many of us may have to look at tapping into investments or our own retirement fund to help support financially the level of care that's currently required. So these can also put some stress and, uh, and burden on us as caregivers. Another area that can be a little less apparent but can actually be um, extremely impactful are those family interpersonal dynamics. It could be the sandwich generation. And this is sort of where I see myself personally right now, managing aging parents. I have um, my, my two daughters are in their 20s and wanting to spend time supporting them with where they're at in their life and their careers. Oftentimes I said to my husband, I feel like I'm in not the sandwich generation, but the panini press, just that multiple levels of stress um, that can be coming temporarily from both ends. So it can really squeeze our limited energy and our resources. And there can also be some potential resentment towards family members that either are, cannot be involved in the level of care that's needing to be provided or choose not to be. So, so if you do feel a little bit of that resentment bubbling up toward other family members, if it's a family caregiving situation, that um, is completely normal. It's a human reaction to a very stressful situation. And like I mentioned before, having some of those career professional stressors can add to this whole interpersonal um, dynamic that we're experiencing. And ultimately, all of the things that I've just mentioned, these uh, phys physical, emotional, financial, and interpersonal dynamics can ultimately end in the creation of a loss of our personal time, which, okay, so now you say, Kelly, okay, so now what do I do about that? Well, that's really the essence of what this entire presentation is about. Again, just we wanted to sort of set the backdrop about what caregiving can look like and to raise and to elevate that awareness of some of the impacts of a caregiver um, so that we're, we're tuned into that. We can bring that to a conscious level. And uh, one thing to note that caregiving, it, the impact on us as an individual, it's very on a very individual level, but it's also very fluid. We may feel like we, we've got this, we feel good about it, we're in control. And one day, something may happen and it can change that entire dyna dynamic of how we're feeling. So just kind of keep tuned with your own emotional and physical state. It can, it can change and be very fluid from day to day, week to week. Um, so just be aware of that with yourself. The one thing that's really important to do is to sort of sit with the emotions that come up and to really, to be, to own them, to feel them. And absolutely, I highlighted this one, validate them. They are real emotions and they are your emotions. And they are important to really understand why they're coming up and what to what to do about them, which we'll get into. Um, and it's important to lose the guilt. Feeling that you're overwhelmed, stressed, even angry or frustrated is perfectly normal human reaction to the challenges that you're facing. So it's important that we lose the guilt. Guilt is a very dense, draining uh, emotion. And it's it's really to our benefit that we can set that aside. 
So now let's focus on what we can do for our own self-care and our well-being. And um, I, I love these kind of sayings. I have a whole bunch of them that I use when I journal every morning. And this one to me is a really uh, powerful, often self-fulfilling prophecy. What I think about, I bring about. So if you can imagine where you were this morning when you were starting your day and what you were thinking about, did you have a list of things that were stressful you were going to have to deal with? Or were you able to really take a moment, step back and think about something that brought you joy and that you were going to make positive difference for yourself and other people? So it's how we sort of frame what we think about. We tend to, our brain can track and make sure that that happens that self-fulfilling prophecy. So again, to elevate to a level of consciousness, what we're ruminating on, what we're worried about, or what we're thinking about, and what we can actually do. Um, there's a, a wonderful saying that I just love this. We can't, if you can't change the stressor, the only thing we can do is to change our response to it. And to me, that's very powerful, but it's also overwhelming. Well, what do I do about that stressor and how I can manage my emotions around it? So let's kind of take a step back in time to our evolutionary past, because this is really a really key part of what our stress as current um, human beings is about. So if we think about um, the, the fight, flight, or freeze response, it's a, a wonderful way of our reptilian brain or our limbic system, which is comprised of several different sort of deep brainstem organs that are responsible for assessing all of the stress, potential stressors through our sense of smell, sight, taste, our emotions, and putting that and coding it into a memory so that if something stresses us in the past, our brain says, we've got you, we know how to respond to this, we're gonna pump you full of adrenaline and cortisol, and we're, we have you ready for fright, flight, fright, or freeze response. Um, so if you imagine, if you're in a caregiving role, that you have your loved one, let's imagine, in your home and you hear a big thud and you realize that that person may have fallen. So naturally your alarm system has sensed that and is sending all kinds of stress hormones to help you react very quickly and very effectively to that threat, that stressor. Or if you are, um, a loved one is still in their own home and you get that call late at night that they need help assistance, just that phone ringing and you look at the caller ID you will feel that same response. Your brain is getting you ready for action. Now, unfortunately, what has happened as we've evolved, we don't necessarily have the same type of physical ability like we did um, thousands of years ago to mitigate or eliminate those stress hormones through physical activity. So they continue to build up in our system and they can become more of a chronic state of inflammation and stress. Um, so it's really important that we tune into what those stressors do with us. If you find yourself, you know, shortness of breath or feeling flushed, feeling that you're perspiring, you're hyper-focused, those are all those stress hormones that are cascading through your body designed to help you prepare yourself for immediate action to that perceived threat. So pay attention to how you're feeling after a call, after something that um, is stressful because unfortunately life is very stressful. And if you're in the role of a caregiver, it can add stress levels upon stress levels. So just tuning in again, elevating that awareness. One thing that I look at is our brains, our limbic systems are much like a toddler, toddler brain. And if you think about a toddler, toddlers can often be scared or overwhelmed or unsure. And if we can act soothing and reassuring and calming, it can calm that toddler. Well, we can treat our brains, almost our limbic system part of our brain, almost the same way by telling us certain messages, by doing certain things that we'll be now spending the rest of our presentation on. And it's amazing once we again elevate and we can become aware of stress and how we can mitigate and how we can actually start to rewire and reframe and reshape our brain and our reaction to the stress that caregiving often brings to us. So the idea is if we can then have a calm brain, and these are those happy hormones, the dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin, and endorphins, and lots of strategies that I'll be telling you about are designed to actually elevate these stress hormones. 
Um, while we were waiting for our program to open tonight, I was having a few folks that came in early to the call before we started recording, just doing some deep breathing, breathing in deeply through your nose, filling your lungs, and then exhaling very deeply through your mouth. Doing that a few times produces that calm sense in our central nervous system throughout our vagus nerve. So something just simple like that can mitigate those stress hormones and help us produce the calming, soothing hormones. Okay. One thing that I think is that this really helped me when I was starting to feel extremely overwhelmed in my current caregiver role was to really sit back very objectively and assess my current schedule and my commitments because I was just existing in a chronic state of overwhelm. I really felt like I wasn't effective at anything that I was doing because I was ruminating and moving on to the next demand on my time or my perceived demand. So what I did is I actually sat down one day at a coffee shop. I took myself away from my home. So it was an objective setting. And I went through for uh, a daily and a weekly detailed task kind of responsibility. What am I actually responsible for in the next week? My work commitments, my family commitments, my own health commitments. Um, I had listed it all out. And then what I did is I had a friend of mine who knows me quite well, take a look at it. Do you notice anything missing? Um, so that I'm having that objective eyes, look it over. And so that I can kind of do a check that yes, that is accurate. And then I looked at what are those things that I call in the second bullet, the takeouts. Um, and it could be takeout meals. But what are the things that I can actually take off my list and list a substitution? And one of the things, for example, was um, we were helping um, my, my parents as well as my mother-in-law do some cleaning in their homes and then trying to maintain our own home. We hired a housekeeper, a family member that had a housekeeping service that was trusted that could come in and do some of those tasks. So that took it off our plate. And then we were thinking of other things that would be sort of easy to swap out our um, time and demands by substituting things in. So if you can think about those things, um, you know, as we get into now season here in New Hampshire is going to be shoveling and sort of maintaining with snow and ice. If there's a, a lawn service that can do that for a loved one, if they're still in their own home, that you're trying to manage multiple households, any of those things that you can, I call them the takeout and substitute in a really safe, viable responsibility. Of course, that may actually look at that financial impact we chatted about earlier. So we have to kind of evaluate all of that. And then I um, think it's important to look at what are those commitments in our weekly or daily little task list that can be temporarily paused. Um, I'm on a, a couple of boards, for example, and it was important for me to maybe pause some committee work for just uh, in the next couple of months where things are really acute. So look at those things that can be not necessarily done away with, but you can put a pause on them. And then the, um, the other thing to look at, the last bullet, is what are some of those things that we've committed to doing that don't necessarily fill our cup? And can we eliminate them? Um, either pause them or completely eliminate them. And oftentimes as caregivers, we are the type of people that will always put others' uh, needs before our own. And especially if you're in a caregiving role, sometimes there's no choice. You have to actually show up and, and perform certain things to provide that level of care or service for a loved one. So just be aware of what your needs to be done and what could be let go. So kind of do that really objective, realistic assessment have a friend or a trusted sort of uh, mentor or a family member that is objective and neutral, take a look at it with you. So you really have a sense of what's on your plate, what doesn't need to be, what could be paused, um, because it's important to really get an accurate sense of where our commitments are, where our time and energy are being allocated. And once you do that, then this is kind of the fun part. Um, it's a mindset reframe exercise. It's another sort of listing exercise to kind of gather this kind of thought. Um, I just finished a book. It's called The Connection Cure. I had heard an interview on NHPR about uh, this author. She went around the world to kind of look at the way healthcare is so strained and so stressed 
that many physicians are just, it's called the diagnose, treat, and repeat model. And they're not really looking at what are the, the real uh, roots of some of our illnesses. Some of them are nonspecific. It might be loneliness, it might be stress. And so many physicians are looking at, instead of asking, what is the matter with you? What are your symptoms? Rather, what matters to you? Because oftentimes, um, we've let go of those things that matter to us as life gets stressful and life gets more demanding. And there's nothing more demanding and stressful in my experience so far than being a caregiver. So one other little exercise that I would suggest you do, again, and, and have that objective friend or family member look at it when you're done, is make a list of those things that matter to you. For me personally, it's spending time in nature. It's being outside with my binoculars. It's taking a walk in the woods. It's sitting out in the sun with a cup of tea. Those are things that fill my cup. Um, some of you, it may be um, taking that favorite novel or your Kindle and just reading, escaping into a wonderful story, or it could be crocheting or knitting or some other type of um, hands-on crafting or hobby that really brings you joy and allows you to just sort of let go of that stress. So make a list of those things that are worth pursuing, that are valid and value valuable to you. Make a list of all those things and um, kind of start it. And it might take a few days to really remember that, oh, that's right, I used to love to do that. That was something fun, a book club, or just kind of really reach back. And that's why it's helpful to have a trusted family member or friend that can look at it objectively and say, well, remember you used to love to do that, or that's kind of a hobby that you've let go. So capture that list of things that matter to you, that bring you joy, that fill your cup. Um, and it could be something just, uh, you know, really something that, or you want to try that you haven't necessarily done yet. Maybe that cooking class that you've been eyeballing. Um, lots of things that you can kind of think about, but it's helpful to ask people that know you well to, to chime in on it too, because they chances are will come up with things that you had not even remembered or thought about. Um, and so with that list, this is what I would suggest that we do. And I've actually started to implement these, um, what I call 10 minute knee breaks. So everything I share with you tonight, I have actually experimented with it, implemented it, and found it extremely beneficial. So I feel like I can sort of endorse my own um, things that have worked for me. Um, and, and it's been hard for me to implement some of these things, but I have found it working. So in terms of the 10 minute me break, um, the exponential benefits that you will get by having 10 minutes of uninterrupted time scheduled right in to your day and put it in your calendar, put it in your um, cell phone calendar with a reminder ping. So it elevates it to that serious level that it's almost like a meeting. It's a commitment that you're making to yourself for yourself. And what I did is I put all of the things that matter to me, those little things that I that bring me such joy. I put them one, one topic on an index card. So I had like a deck of cards. So um, each evening I would pick three things from the deck of cards and I would schedule it right into my calendar. Um, so, you know, I finally am actually making headway when this novel that I've, a Maeve Minchie book that I've been, I think reading now for months by reading that 10 minutes a day. And it's such a small amount of time, but the exponential benefits of committing to sort of nurturing yourself is, is, is just beyond measure. Um, and then like anything new that you're doing, it will require a little bit of routine and habit building. So that's why I think by putting them in your calendar, scheduling them right into your phone with a reminder, little um, noise will elevate it to that at the level of, oh, that's right, I'm going to be doing that. And then set boundaries. This is really an important thing. The next two things, losing the guilt and setting the boundaries were where I personally really struggled with this because I felt guilty taking time for myself where there were so many other things that needed to be tended to. But if you could look at it, 10 minutes is really not a long time in the sense of relaxation and sort of recovering your sense of self in what matters to you is incredibly powerful. Set boundaries. If you're um, enjoying your 10 minute me break at home and there are other family members around, just gently let them know what you're doing and so that you're not interrupted. Um, I find a lot of time outside is, is just naturally a great uh, boundary setter that works quite well. 
And the important thing is to enjoy it. If it's something that's not resonating with you, then, then don't do it. Move on to the next thing that was on your matter list. And it's really important to, again, as caregivers, we tend to deal potentially with a lot of guilt and feeling like I should be doing other things. Congratulate yourself when you are able to implement these me breaks for yourself. Talk to yourself as if you're talking to a friend. Imagine how your friend would be speaking to you. Like, I'm so glad that you're doing that for yourself. That's awesome. You deserve it. Enjoy it. So talk to yourself in the third person. So it kind of helps with that whole guilt issue. Okay, so these are the 10 minute me breaks. So what I would suggest you do is the two sort of exercises in terms of the assessment of your current schedule and all the demands or pieces within it, and then really start making that 10 minute me break list based on the things that matter to you. Those are really powerful tools that make you feel um, less overwhelmed, less burned out, more hopeful, which will absolutely help with those feel good hormones, those calming hormones that we talked about. We need to have our brain setting out, even thinking about setting that list and, and enjoying it and doing it will release some of the dopamine and the serotonins that will help with stress and feeling of overwhelm. Okay. The other thing that I have found extremely valuable is to create what we call a landing station at home. So when you're coming home, whether it's from work, an appointment, from providing care to a, uh, a loved one that may not live in your home, and you're coming home feeling really stressed and frazzled, um, you, it's important to create a decompression area that will provide refuge so that you can actually regain your sense of self, mitigate that stress. So um, if you think about your home space, most likely there's going to be a little nook or even a room that will come to mind to the place where you feel almost the stress of the day. You can just let it go. So really start thinking about what that looks like and start shaping that place physically so that it continues to have that refuge, that welcoming feeling, uh, decluttering, adding comforting items and objects. I have a little area in my um, my home office that's my dining room that has a little water fountain, several big plants. I have a real fun pillow that I can sit there in front of that. I can dim some lights that are in that room. And I have a wonderful candle that I made with my uh, family. We did one of those candle pouring activities last year. And by just sitting on that pillow, hearing the bubbling water fountain, seeing and touching the plants and smelling that candle, I can absolutely feel my stress starting to mitigate and feeling that I have a little place of refuge, my landing station to reset my energy in between being out of the home and um, and then you know coming back home. Or if the caregiving situation is in your home currently, then it's important, even more important, I would say, to create that landing station within your own home. So you do feel like you have a little bit of an outlet, a little place for your own energy to be recharged. And all of us respond to different sensory um, items differently. I'm really uh, angered in sense of smell and touch. And some of us may be, you want to close your eyes and listen to some soft music, some subtle music, or some beautiful lighting. So think about how you respond from a sensory perspective to certain things within your home that you can create that little landing station. Um, I think often of the times that I've scheduled uh, large vacations, you know, maybe a week away and how much effort and energy that that takes. And oftentimes they're wonderful, but I have found some of those little mini vacation retreats. It could be a couple of hours to myself um, on a Saturday or Sunday, or it could be maybe a weekend away with my husband it has much more benefit exponential benefit than that week's vacation plan. So, um, and one thing when I teach some wellness courses, we look at that someday aisle. And that's why I have this little island in the distance here on this particular slide. It's that tendency of we all have to, well, once that situation is resolved or the someday I will be able to get to do that again. And that can build up to a feeling of overwhelm and resentment, resentment because when is that someday aisle coming? So that's why it's more important to look for those landing stations, those little 10 minute me breaks and embrace our self-care today, every single day. Okay, 
So uh, again, uh, as Mary introduced, I am a naturalist, a self-taught naturalist. I absolutely adore being outside. It's where I feel my best and doing lots of research on just countless meta-analysis studies of our human connection with our natural environment absolutely does support the idea that when we are outside connecting with nature, the benefits are, they're, they're not disputed at all. We have less stress, our stress reduction is immediate, and our increase in our attention and our focus and our energy is rather immediate. And one thing I love too, especially as we come into sort of cold flu, COVID coming around again season, it is an increase in a boost to our immunity system. So um, lots of benefits. And um, when I do teach classes on wellness with nature, people inevitably say, well, you know, maybe I'll be able to schedule something in this weekend, a little walk in the woods, a hike, or even a little jaunt up to the White Mountains or natural, you know, a park nearby within an hour of my home. And those are all good, but it's that someday I'll, someday I'll get to do that and I will embrace that connection with nature. So um, what I've decided is to come up with some strategies to have an easy daily nature connection by weaving things right in to our existing routine. And that's really important to me, again, because I recognize I don't see you, but I can actually feel that you're all probably experiencing the same um, sense of overwhelm potentially that I'm experiencing as a caregiver that I don't have enough time in my day to do a lot of things. So things that are effective, that I want to make some changes have to work right in with my existing routine. So one thing, um, the first one on the list here is a five minute skyline. So if you are working from home or if you are on your way to work in the morning, coming back in the afternoon, just stop. Take a moment, do that deep breathing that we talked about in the beginning by inhaling through your nose. Fill your lungs with that fresh air being outside and then release it through exhaling through your mouth. Do that a few times to center yourself because you'll start to actually make those connections with your nervous system that something relaxing is about to come. Again, that little Todd the brain knows it's almost like at bedtime, a toddler knows a really fun story is coming. Certain routine things will spur that uh, memory. And then once you center yourself and you can kind of be present and mindful of where you are, take a moment and look up, look at the clouds, look at the trees, look at the skyline. Especially here in New Hampshire, a foliage where I am and hooks it is just about peak. So there's, if there's ever a great time to be looking at the skyline. It's in the next week or so as we have the glorious colors of our fall foliage. Or even in the winter time when the trees have lost their leaves and the beautiful bones of the trees, their branches and their limbs are silhouetted against, you know, maybe a, a real crisp loose winter sky. So by looking at the skyline, what we're doing is we're taking that focus of our brain away from our rumination and our worry and our stress and we're allowing it to settle down for a moment and experience something more positive and restorative so take advantage of the skyline um, the clouds as we come into the end of october november are spectacular beautiful beautiful cloud banks that you can see every day the next thing that i do and this started when i was teaching um, young children and we were out in the woods and i would have maybe uh, 40 kids that would come off a bus and be in the woods with me. And you can imagine the mayhem and chaos. And I had to find a way to kind of calm us and, and really center us really quickly. So I had um, each child, and I do this routinely with myself, and I teach adults to do it too, is to stand, center ourselves, and pretend you're on a really slow turning wheel so that you're actually challenging your brain as you're turning very, very slowly over the course of about 30 seconds to 60 seconds, 360 degrees by pretending you're on that slow turning wheel. Notice what's ahead of you, in front of you. Is it um, the different leaf patterns, the different tree patterns, or you could be in a park. Are you seeing children playing? If you could even be in a situation outside your back door, are you looking at maybe some gardens, a fence? Come back around and see your home in a different light. So it's fun to do that nature 360. And if you do have an extra minute, 
You can even gently rotate back the opposite way and challenge your sense of sight. What am I seeing different going this direction? And that's two minutes that you no longer, um, you have don't have a competition with the, the ruminations and worry of your brain. You're kind of replacing that, resetting your energy and your focus. Um, I'm all about deep breathing. And I try to do this often because studies show once we enter school around the age five, we stop that beautiful restorative belly breathing that we have as toddlers or infants. If you can think about a toddler, they have that beautiful deep belly breath when they breathe, which oxygenates our brain and our body. It calms our nervous system. It energizes us physically as well as calming our emotional state. So one breathing sequence that I've been doing for a while now, it's called mountain breathing. And I'll just kind of walk you through it. So you have one hand that you can imagine as your template. It's a mountain range with five wonderful peaks. And you can think of each peak as having either a special memory, a really wonderful thought, a positive affirming word, or something that when you reach the peak of, of that mountain range, of that particular one, you have that in your mind. So you're basically starting to pair your breathing with a wonderful positive uh, visualization. On your opposite hand, you're going to have your hiker is ready. So the, what's the benefit of this is the actual physical touch as you're creating that memory in your brain is more powerful than just doing the visualization alone. So again, with all deep breathing, you want to make sure that you're kind of calm and centered and mindful about what you're going to do. And then you breathe in deeply through your nose as you go up that peak, hold at the peak and think of that word, scene or affirmation. And now you're going to bring your hiker down into the valley by exhaling through your mouth. It can also be very effective to close your eyes if you're in a situation where you can you do that. And then you're going up the next peak, breathing in through your nose, holding it at the top. It might be a different happy word or a positive affirmation. Exhale very deeply through your mouth into that next valley. And you can really make sure that you have strong contact with your hiker, with your um, opposite hand. And then continue that sequencing, breathing in very slowly through your nose. At the top, you notice that this is the highest, the tallest peak. And then come down, breathing very deeply through your mouth. Okay, we go up that next peak. And then the breath comes back out slowly through your mouth. And this last peak, make this really the most effective and powerful one. It's the shortest peak, but let's make it the most powerful. Bring that breath in through your nose. Really hold it and then blow it out through your mouth deeply, almost like all the way back down to the road where you started. So one thing that's effective with this, because again, that brain is taking in the sensory experience, it's creating that memory. So after you've done this a few times, your brain will absolutely be able to produce that same restorative calm feeling if you just touch your hiker finger to your mountain range. So it's really something effective if you're in a situation where you need instant calm of your vagus nerve and your sense of stress, you can just kind of rub your hiker and your brain will say, that's right, I remember that really effective calming breathing sequence. So that's why I love uh, mountain breathing because you always have your template and you can really um, have a very effective grounding experience. Nature stretching. Um, this is something that many of us are now working at computers day in and day out. We're much more sedentary than we've ever been, which um, AARP had a wonderful article in one of their magazines a few months ago that they're discussing what we call the new sitting disease. Because we are becoming so sedentary, we are not moving our lymphatic systems. We're not moving our energy and our blood and all the things as human beings we're designed to do. We're designed to move, to feel our best. So one thing that um, I tend to hold as many, many of us do, stress and tension in our upper shoulders, in our, our upper back, and even into our cervical region. So periodically throughout the day, just to get up and stretch. 
And one thing, I, I'm a very uh, visual person, a very um, sort of, my, my daughters call me, you're very flowery with your descriptions, mom. I think that's because I just love to be out in nature and I relate to so many elements of it. But uh, one thing that I love to teach and do myself is what I call um, butterfly wings. And the idea of this is if you imagine yourself, of, uh, think about the monarch caterpillars that are now, well, they were in the chrysalises about a month ago. And as that caterpillar is now becoming a beautiful butterfly, it's wrapped tightly in its chrysalis and it's starting to emerge. It's sort of breaking through that chrysalis and those beautiful new wings have to just kind of hang and dangle as the new formed butterfly is pumping blood into those soft wings. So you're kind of floating your arms around and then over the period of really four hours, it takes for the monarch to stiffen those wings to be an, uh, eligible for flight. So then you want to pretend you're that monarch with those really beautiful stiff wings. I have a, a, a monarch little thing that I put on for kids. I should have worn it tonight for you. And then you want to have those stiff wings just kind of float out to the side. And this is a nice chance to sort of stretch your fingers too. So if, especially if you've been typing to kind of move all of those muscles and ligaments. So that's a, something really fun and simple to do that you can do within 45 seconds. And try to do that often, just even rolling your shoulders to sort of move that lymphatic fluid around, move your muscles around so that you are um, actually reducing your stress with that. Sit spots for calm. Um, Again, if we can continue to pair a certain experience with calm, uh, and I love to go outside, sit on my back steps all seasons, except for obviously teeming rain, it's not that comfortable. Make a spot in your um, in your in your immediate surroundings. Whether if you live in an apartment or a condo, there may be sort of a little bit of a green space near your building, or if you're in a standalone home, you may have a front or back door that you can sit out. And routinely visit that spot, do some deep breathing, and then actually look around to see what is going on. What are the changes in the season? If you're so inspired, bring out a little nature journaling notebook. So you're kind of sketching or you're noting with descriptive language what's going on. I even have uh, hula hoops that I'll throw out there and get in down there with a magnifying glass to sort of really take it to the point where I can forget about what I might be worried, worrying on. Uh, walking with a purpose. This is a beautiful time of year before we get into snow and ice to really be walking in, in your neighborhood, in your immediate surroundings. Even if, if you're working in a place that has gorgeous uh, trails, if your office park has that, get out at lunch and walk and start to focus on what you're noticing. Um, I love to walk around my neighborhood this time of year and notice all of the beautiful fall decorations. Who has the best a uh, display of pumpkins or, you know, scarecrows or even the corn stalks in the mailbox post. So just walking with a purpose. In the spring, listening to the birds starting to sing again. You can challenge yourself to just focus your attention on something deliberate rather than worrying about something. It's Because it, the brains, we cannot really multitask very effectively. If we're engaged in a certain task that's fun and purposeful, we tend to let stress um, kind of stay in the background. And then to be grounded in nature, this is something that um, I think the term tree hugger came from this because there really is a science that is showing that when we actually touch the bark of trees, we do feel better because of the pheromones that trees are releasing. So if you have a favorite uh, smooth beech tree around you or maybe rough bark of a pine tree, or even if you're, um, if you're brave and daring, this is a great time of year with the warm stones out back or even pavement. Take your shoes and socks off and actually ground your feet in nature so you can kind of feel that energy coming from the ground, from the magnetic field within our planet. So these are just some quick, easy nature connections you can weave day in and day out right into your existing routine. Um, and again, when we're starting to establish new habits and routines, it's important to plug them into our calendars. So we're we're kind of getting away from that routine type of day in and day out stuff. I'll put them on a index card like we talked about with doing the 10 minute knee breaks or however it works for you so that you will actually um, remember. I remember when I was starting to look 
at doing the five minute skyline before I um, got in and out of my car. I had an index card that just wrote skyline on my dashboard. So I said, oh, that's right, of course. I just need to kind of lock my car, take a deep breath or two and look around at what my environment is showing me in that skyline. So whatever it takes to sort of remind yourself to make that um, commitment to yourself for some type of change. Okay. Um, and then bringing nature inside. Again, we're getting to that time of year where shortly darkening days, snow and ice potentially coming. It may be a little bit more challenging for us to get outside and implement some of the things that we just talked about. However, there's ways to bring nature inside very simply without, you know, kind of making a big production in your home. Uh, one of the things that I love to do are create terrariums, and I will be doing that shortly. I just can't wait. This is a great time of year where the moss is now green again with some rain. So, um, in fact, I've done a couple of workshops with AARP to actually create these mini little terrariums that you can see in this image, at the bottom of the pictures here. Where, but you can do this at home as well. You can take small glass bowl. It could be even a little fish bowl, or it could be something you get at the dollar store and fill it with a little bit of sand in the bottom and then some potting soil and then go outside and rummage around and get natural materials. Bring it back in and then just add a little bit of water so that you have some moisture in this bowl and then start placing the moss and the lichens. And just like if you were, when you were a child, you were out doing the fairy gardens, it's a chance to really connect with nature in a beautiful way. So you have this little mini wooded microcosm environment that you can have in your home throughout the winter, especially if you live in the Northeast or, or the Northern part of our country and you have snow and ice and then the woods are, are covered for a couple of months, then you have a little section of woods and then put a little piece of um, plastic wrap over it. So you're creating that condensation, periodically lift the condens uh, the plastic wrap and give it a really deep sniff and you will sm smell beautiful uh, wooded aroma. So again, your brain is saying, ooh, that's something that's really soothing and beautiful to be out in the woods. So you can create that situation immediately. The other thing I love to do is to create these seasonal centerpieces. There's one up here that I created a few years ago. I took a quick picture of it. It's basically just a big bowl, fill it with about an inch of water, Add some leaves from outside, maybe some geraniums, um, some chrysanthemums, and then float a few tea lights. It literally took me two minutes to gather the materials, maybe one minute to make it, but it's a wonderful thing to have so you can have mindful eating. You can actually spend 10 or 15 minutes with no device on, and you have phones are silent, laptops are shut, and you are nourishing your body in a beautiful restorative way with a healthy meal and a beautiful centerpiece that's connecting you right with nature. So you've got a lot of sort of double duty things here by being outside, collecting these items, creating them, and then enjoying them inside. Um, shortly, we'll be having the opportunity to go outside and cut some winter bouquets, I call them. It's It could be with bare tree um, branches that have fallen down and adding them to maybe some hemlock, or pine boughs, or some of the more evergreen um, species that might be around your home. And having that little bouquet in your home so you can kind of smell the pine tree. I love when we get into the balsam season shortly with Christmas trees. I have a lot of that around my house because that's a source of um, joy to me to have those aromas around. House plants, it could be something simple, or it could be um, something that you've propagated Ferns are wonderful, easy house plants. There's lots of stuff online. If you do have pets around or young children, you just want to do your due diligence and research to make sure it's a safe plant to have for um, two-legged and four-legged family members. But again, house plants can be um, air purifiers by NASA has done a lot of research here. Having a rosemary plant or a basil, you can be kind of crushing that um, herb gently, smelling it and imagining yourself back in a beautiful, calm summer day, especially as we get into sort of the more um, dark times that we're entering now as we get close to um, this time when um, we're losing daylight, precious daylight very quickly. Even having 
pictures of nature can be very restorative. So it's important if you have a screensaver or you have pictures that you've taken, or there's lots of different artwork you can find online to actually have pictures of nature around. Maybe it's something you put in that landing station that we talked about. So bringing nature inside is really a very effective way to connect with nature that you're not, um, you can do this quickly and safely given potential snow and ice coming up. Okay, so just to kind of uh, frame again, how we can take care of ourselves. You'll notice here that I have the oxygen mask. I was on a recent flight and we, for anyone who's flown, you, you could probably recite this instead of having the flight attendant do it. The importance of putting your own oxygen mask on first before you help anyone else. So your self-care should be equated as your oxygen mask. To be effective, to help anybody else, you need to make sure that you are helping yourself first and only you can do that. So setting your mindset as this is important, this is essential for my well-being, to be an effective caregiver, to take care of myself. And like we mentioned, small incremental steps, doing things so that you're building these new routines, these new sense of purpose for yourself. And I, I just can't emphasize this enough that we should be treating ourselves as we a friend would treat us or we would want to treat a friend. Speak in that third person and be very uh, congratulatory, very proud of what you're doing for your own self-care and be authentic. If something that you're implementing does not resonate, change it out. Don't spend too much time on it. If it's not working, absolutely move on to something else. Okay, so as we, as we mentioned and Mary mentioned in the beginning, um, some of the resources, particularly AARP, and there is that website in the chat, uh, has just invaluable information, resources for caregivers and their families. And, and Mary mentioned it's in multiple languages, so it's a tremendous resource to start looking to sort of bookmark on your laptop, look into those resources, especially as your caregiver needs change or if like we said if you are anticipating moving into the role of a caregiver for a loved one or a family member it's really nice to have some of these things uh, thought through or identified or connected with ahead of time so that you really feel empowered and less overwhelmed by what might be coming a lot of visiting nurse associations and communities provide excellent types of services that many um, health insurance will actually accept that so that's a great resource as well Geriatrician support groups are wonderful. A lot of them have a mental health component to help with some of the, maybe the mental health issues of a loved one that's aging so that they can be best supported with the natural aging process. Um, health and human service organizations within your state also have some great resources to go on. I put the New Hampshire one here in the, um, the group because that's where I'm living currently. And think, think too about chatting with other people in your community, friends or other groups about where did you get resources? Where did you get help? Visiting angels, Meals on Wheels, home health aides. There are a lot of resources to help you so you don't have to navigate this journey alone. Um, financial resources, there's all kinds of things to support. Remember that slide we talked about, about your takeouts, things that you can actually delegate to the professionals, to other organizations to sort of lighten your load so that your caregiving responsibilities, your caregiving presence can be uh, healthier for you as well as your loved one. So um, there's that old expression, it takes a village. And I really believe that living this journey we call life does take a village to do it effectively, do it calmly and doing it really in the most enriched way. So know that you're not alone. There's lots of support and help out there. And, and just please use your resources so that you are the most effective caregiver, but you're also taking best care of yourself because that's really where it all starts is that self-care, that oxygen mask going on first. So that's um, what I had to present tonight. I'm not sure, Mary, if we have any questions or things that people want to chat about in the maybe the two minutes before we're at the top of our hour of our time together? Uh, no, uh, we do not have any questions. Um, and I do want to mention to, um, there were a few people that did join us late, um, just to remind them and everyone else that the recording for this event will be on the AARP YouTube channel 
um, at uh, www.youtube.com slash at AARPNH1. I did put that link in the chat. And I also did put in um, the resources for AARP. And I know you also have additional resources um, that you mentioned uh, on your PowerPoint slide. Right, well, thank you. Thank you all. And again, just be, be honored that you're here. You, done a wonderful service for yourself. And if you um, are just joining us, please check out this, um, this recording so that there are some resources for you. There's some other quick little simple things that you can do to support your own well-being. Um, and congratulate yourself on taking your well-being very seriously because it's really the best way to be a caregiver. And enjoy the um, the fall that we have coming up. Beautiful weather ahead here in New Hampshire. So if you are in New Hampshire like I am, please find some couple of minutes this in the next few days to get out and enjoy it. It's very restorative. Oh, thank you so much, Kelly. I know um, mm -hmm. it, some of the things that you said tonight resonated with me, and I'm, I'm sure it resonated with some of our audience also. Um, so I hope that people can, you know, look at the recording, replay the recording because there are some very helpful hints that you have given us. Um, thank you everybody for joining us tonight. And we are having uh, more virtual events. And also we do have some in-person events like Kelly mentioned, we uh, will be having a making your own terrarium workshop. And you can find those events at aarp.org slash NH. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you everyone.